Well, welcome to our talk studio, Bob. It's great to have you in studio with us. Bob Collymore, CEO of Safaricom. It's been a good year. It's been a good year. I'm sorry, I'm feeling slightly <laughs> croaky today. Oh, is it <laughs> a bit of a cold? A, a bit of a uh, throat infection, I think. A polesana. We, wish, uh, we hope that you get well soon. Going into the whole uh, m m shillings and cents, let's start there, the business aspects. And uh, 17.5 billion, I think, is the... Uh, what you reported this year in terms of uh, your after-tax profit and dividends paid to shareholders over 12 billion, I think it was. It, it's a significant year for Safaricom. And yet we see that voice revenues are not growing. In fact, uh, if anything, they're declining. SMS revenues not doing badly. But what are the other areas that have stunned you in terms of growth and development for the company? Well, actually, both voice and SMS are, in fact, growing. Uh, what you're what you're saying is reflecting what's happening with the rest of the industry around the world. And so safari comms are growing. Everybody our else is revenue, declining. Our voice revenue grew last year and continues to grow this year. SMS have also had a pretty good year. Um, many people have said that SMS has also reached the peak, and people are going to be using WhatsApp and BBM. Uh, in fact, we haven't seen that because we haven't seen a large enough penetration of smartphones. But we're also making it easy. So we're putting some bundles together with SMSs so that people can use SMS in the same way as their wealthier colleagues can use WhatsApp. Okay, let's, let's talk about M-Pesa. And, and it's lauded globally. But I think more importantly on the local scene, it's transformed business for a lot of people and regionally as well. Um, you know, going into financial services, it's a fascinating area. Are you facing challenges where, you know, uh, for instance, certain competitors in the industry are worried about uh, you know, the impact that you're having, the banking sector, for instance. And what kind of revenues now is M-Pesa sitting on? Well, you know, um, <laughs> people think that we're competing with them, but, but they're looking at the wrong thing. Actually, what M-Pesa competes with is cash. It's not with banks. And so, you know, we partner with a lot of banks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my friends at uh, KCB or uh, or Barclays, um, you know, these guys, they get it and they understand what M-Pesa is doing is tackling the scourge of cash. What's the problem with cash? Cash is actually the enemy of government because they have to print it, they have to distribute it. It's the enemy of businesses because managing cash is expensive. Getting it to the bank, people are robbed. Um, they're, they're even, you know, if you have a shop, um, you know, your shop staff, it's not likely to give you all of the money they take. So that is what we're trying to, to, to tackle. The other person for whom it's an enemy is the ordinary Manaichi. Because if, you have, if you're poor and you have some cash, how do you save it? Mm -hmm. You can save it in the shack, but you know the shack is pretty small. And people know there's not many places for you to hide it. So you go into some shacks and the guys will sit on the bed. And he wouldn't let you sit there because that's where the money is. That's his back. And, mm -hmm. and you know if that place goes up in fire, then the money goes. And so M-Pesa aims to tackle that, not so much the bank. So when we launched Mshwari, do you recall when we launched Mshwari about eight months ago? Um, you know, people said we're tackling banks. No, we're not. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's not a single bank in the world that can allow you to save one shilling. And that's what you can do with Mshwari. And that's proven to be a huge success. We have about two million customers who are currently signed up to Mshwari. And, you know, these guys have deposited something like uh, 16, just over 16 billion shillings so far. That's 16 billion shillings, which was not sitting in banks. They were sitting in mattresses and in lockboxes. So it's, it's, it's doing pretty well, and it continues to do well. It's the most exciting thing that's happening for us. And, um, you know, you asked what's the next big thing. Well, Lipa and M-Pesa, which we launched uh, only a few weeks ago, you know, I tasked the team to sign up 11,000 in the first month. In fact, they were pleased to send me a message on Thursday night to say they signed up 13,000 and they're targeting 100,000 merchants by the end of the year. So we think that's going to be a big game changer. It's, it's, so you're seeing more complementarity rather than competition with other players uh, in, well, in the banking sector particularly? Yes, for sure. A lot of the banks are pretty fractious about this. And I keep reading that people are uh, knocking on the doors for interoperability. And, and I say that you know, customers aren't really asking for interoperability. What customers are asking for and what regulators need to turn their minds to is cross-border transfers. Mm -hmm. People need to move money from Uganda to Kenya or from the US to Kenya. Not 
you know, they don't have a problem moving money between mobile operators within the country. But of course, you know, we will have our detractors and we, we learn to deal with them. That's, that's the nature of business. Uh, talking about uh, Safaricom's network now, and um, we were in Turkana just recently, yeah. and uh, we'll talk about Kenyans for Kenya in just a short while, amazing transformative uh, project there, campaign, um, and we're coming to that. But just the issue of secure insecurity in far out areas across the country where people were literally begging and saying we need networks everywhere because we are you know really at the mercy of uh, some of the you know uh, whether it's cattle raiders or whatever the, the it might be what is your plan with respect to expanding the network right mm. across Kenya and especially to those far out areas you know I had a meeting with the regulator last week to talk about this whole issue of quality of service and of coverage. Um, we are currently covering, covering nearly 90% of the population. Uh, beyond that, it really doesn't make commercial sense. And even the site that we saw in Kaikou, mm -hmm. you know, that site is generating about 9,000 calls per day, which is a lot. But actually, I'm it, having it's to use... It's stunning because you wouldn't imagine that many people in an area like that making calls. But even when we went there two years ago, you know, the guys were saying, uh, well, you know, we call that hill the Safaricom Hill <laughs> because we have to climb the hill and climb the tree to get to coverage. Now, despite we're, the fact that we're doing 9,000 a day, it still is uneconomic. You know, it still doesn't make any sense for me because I have to transmit that via satellite. But, as you said, the need, the security need is important, and so we have to reach that. So when people are in Nairobi complaining about quality of service, and, and for sure, they, they, they should do. I'm not denying that. Um, we also have an obligation to meet those security needs in places like mm -hmm. um, you know, Pocot. Uh, you know, I was in Tana, in the Tana Delta, a, a little while back with the Red Cross. And, you know, people said to me, you know, Buonasio, uh, give us a booster. Mm. And, you know, uh, Abbas Goulet, our, our good friend, Secretary General of the Red Cross, he said, uh, you know, I think Bob has heard you, leave him alone. Mm. And the, the chairman of the peace committee there, you remember the problems we had in August last mm -hmm. year? The chairman said, to, he looked at me, he said, Bob, you need to understand that the next time they come, we don't want to be hiding under our bed as they rape our wives. And that is the point when you think, you know, quality service is important and we have to fix that, but we also need to do the things which are just the right things to do. So, uh, you know, this could be a part of giving back to community is saying, look, we just need to get these masks up. They're not yet profitable, but, you know, we've just got to do it. Absolutely, absolutely. That speaking of quality of service, of course, your license is up for renewal next year. CCK has said, you know, these are the standards that we require you to meet. Are you at all worried that uh, you might not meet the quality standards? Not at all. You know, at the, when we did our half year results last November, uh, I stood up and I said that I was not happy with the quality of the service that we were delivering. And so we set out on a project which we called the best network in Kenya. And that is, um, has picked six major towns and cities. And we will, uh, on voice quality, on drop call rates, on call completion, on data speeds, we have set out to be the best network. And that will be independently, uh, independently verified by a company which is called P3 from, from Europe. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we shared these, these thoughts and plans with the CCK last week. And uh, I'm pleased to say that there are you know, they're happy with the progress we're making so far. It is still working progress, and there are a lot of challenges that we have. You know, people are complaining about us digging up the roads. Well, I'm happy to say that so far we've dug up 500 kilometers in Nairobi, and we're nearly done. You know, we said we would do um, between five and 600 kilometers in Nairobi, and then we move out and we'll start to disrupt other, other, other cities towns. and towns. Mm -hmm. But the reason for that is because it is required in order to do to deliver the quality of service that you as a customer are demanding. Let's move from uh, the issue of the business itself for a while and look at the campaigns. And you know, I recall distinctly two years ago getting a call from your office saying, this is what we're doing and we're asking yourself and the media to come and be partners. The Horn of Africa drought has had happened. Millions were facing starvation. And there we started Kenyans for Kenya, a remarkable campaign. Um, just recently, we were in Kaikor, Turkana, where we went two years ago and seeing the food and the people and happy children, chubby babies. What does that transformation mean to you? And what lessons can we take from Kenyans for Kenya? 
It, it means a lot for me. And someone asked me the other day, what's, what's been my high, my high point in the, in the time I've been here? And absolutely, Kenyans for Kenya. And the reason for that is because uh, for the first time I experienced, and I don't know whether other people had experienced this before, I experienced Kenyans really coming together uh, f for a common cause. You know, they got it. And for the first time, you know, I developed some friends that I didn't have before. So I called the guys from the media. I called uh, Citizen, uh, Nation, and, and all the, the, the Jeff entire... Jeff Koinange was the there. And Koinange, the who actually, I think he's in, he's in town group. today. Mm -hmm. But we all got together. And over one breakfast, we decided that we needed to do this. And actually, I remember one of the media uh, CEOs said to me, I don't think you're nearly ambitious enough. Let's go for half a billion shillings. And we said, OK, fine. Let's run this for, uh, for four weeks. And then when I called uh, uh, our friend Caroline, Caroline, Matoko, Caroline, said, <laughs> Caroline said, look, I don't think you can run this campaign for four weeks. It, uh, you know, campaigns for two weeks is, is enough. And after two weeks, we'd hit the half a billion. And then we said, well, what are we going to do now? But Kenyans, uh, you know, they were so keen to help that we continued the campaign for the full four weeks. I mean, I think we were all getting a bit tired at the end of it. And we raised, I think, 677 uh, million shillings plus the in-kind, which took us close to the billion shillings. And then we were able to see the, you know, the, the last of the projects, which were the long-term projects in Kaikor. But we've also done projects in, the, in East Pokot. I was there uh, to open a dam, which will hold, I think, 321 million gallons of, uh, million liters of, of water. And that will feed about five, will service about 5,000 people. In Moyali, we've also done four boreholes um, and of course in Kaikor we've done the four boreholes and we've seen the difference that it's going to make to about 15,000 people. And you and I, when we were coming back, you remember I said actually we've moved this thing on from a drought story mm -hmm. to quite a transformational story. Do you remember we stopped and we saw a school, yeah. a school which was a makeshift school uh, and we were looking for the building and it wasn't a building at all, it was under a tree. And what had happened whilst the teachers were striking in the rest of the country, here was a teacher who was being paid mm -hmm. by the parents who were now making an income from the, the crops which Kenyans had, had funded, the, 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 the shed nets, um, the shade nets, the, the boreholes. We were now seeing tomatoes, we were seeing skumawiki. We are seeing all of this stuff which is now being sold, which is now funding the teacher, which was now taking those children out of the, out of the, the pastures where they were, they were herding goats. And you remember I said to you, these children, how could they ever become the next president of this country? Mm -hmm. It is only through education. And so what we did is we went beyond simply feeding people to starting to educate them. And you know how passionate, I can talk all night about this, <laughs> you know how passionate I feel about that transformation that, uh, that we collectively have done. And this is perhaps something that we don't often talk about is positive unintended consequences. Yes. And um, really, at the end of the day, two years ago when we were in Kaikor, children were ready to die. They were too hungry to even cry anymore. And this time, as Bob is saying, they were sitting under a makeshift hut learning. A teacher was teaching as the rest of the country was on strike. It, it, it was really profound. And thank you to everybody who sent money because this was really an initiative that was a collective effort. So thank you so much for that. Moving on now to the campaign called Bring Zach Back. Yes. And some people, you know, laughingly ask, where is Zach now? So Bob, what's the situation with the campaign? So, you know, Bring Zach Back came about through our World of Difference campaign, which we can talk about in a second. Um, but this, this remarkable, uh, remarkable guy, who I think we all know the story, you know, he was paralyzed one Saturday afternoon. Uh, we set him off to go to, uh, to Cape Town uh, because that was the nearest place we can find uh, a rehab center. Mm -hmm. um, we set out to raise 250 million shillings. Um, so far, the campaign has raised 60 million shillings, which was enough to get us started. And in fact, on the 17th, which is next Saturday, uh, I'm joining a few other people, and I, I'm hoping, and I'm going to put him on the spot now, but I'm hoping the deputy president will also join us. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Your Excellency, if you're watching, uh, you're going to have to book your diary. Uh, but we're hoping that he will join us for the laying of the cornerstone, because we started to build that to put that building up. But what, you know, the campaign isn't finished. Of course, we can't send poor old Zach all the way down to, to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And he's done a sterling job. He I think has. he's worked harder than anybody else in this campaign. But the 60 million shillings was enough to get us started. It is still an ongoing campaign. You know, the Kenya Paraplegic Organization still does require uh, our help and our assistance. And so, you know, if you, you get online, you'll see 
how you can uh, continue to contribute there. But I also ask the corporates, because the corporates are the people who can make the big the biggest shift, difference. you know, mm -hmm. so we all ask them to, to continue to help us. Okay, especially those that, I mean, you know, road accidents contribute uh, largely to uh, this whole issue of paraplegics. Um, and, and obviously, uh, you know, any others who are in a space where this affects you, please do stand up and do something about it. Let's, 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 let's talk elections, Bob, for a minute. We'll come back to world of difference in just a short while. Let's talk elections I thought we were first. done with the elections. No, 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 yeah, did we? No, we haven't discussed <laughs> that. Um, so, you know, the digital system did not work in the last election. That was March 4th. You know, halfway through the week, we moved from digital to manual systems. There was a whole lot said about why that system failed. You know, the good news is Makweni recently was a success story, I think. Okay. However, I do know that Safaricom had set conditions precedent to its participation in the Makweni by-election. So I ask you, Bob, what was the difference between the national election and the Makweni by-election why did it work this time? Well, you know, <laughs> uh, you're, you're really are putting me on the spot here. Um, th there was nothing about this process which was that difficult. And what particularly annoyed me as a resident in this country, not necessarily a citizen, is that there were people who were saying, you know, why would Kenya try to choose something so complex? Um, you know, shouldn't they have tried it in some other country? And you think, to hell with you. You know, because we're just not capable of doing complex things. Kenya, <laughs> the message. you know, uh, one in two, more than one in two mobile money is being transferred here in Kenya. Um, you know, the things that we have achieved, if you go to High Hub and you see the stuff that those guys are doing, it's remarkable. And so, you know, it, it, it grates me as, as the CEO for one of the, uh, the ICT companies in this part of the world, uh, you know, the biggest ICT company in this part of the world, to listen to people say that you can't do this. Of course you can do it, it's a simple process. And I think the Makweni uh, by-election proved it, um, proved it quite well. So what was the issue? <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the issue? What are the lessons that we take from this? Um, you, you know, you have to prepare. You have to, you, you, you have to, to, to get into that process having you know, doing the same as we would do. If we were doing um, a change of the billing system, mm -hmm. what we would typically do is we would do two dry runs. And you have to have two successive, successful dry runs. It's not good having a good one, then a bad one, and then, you know, two successive. And so you have to really kind of go through, go through the drill. And um, I, I think that uh, we probably didn't have enough time to do that the mm -hmm. first time around. When I say we, I mean the country. I don't mean... Because actually what we did was something quite simple. We provided what's called a virtual private network which is just the ability to, to encrypt some information at one end, send it through a pipe, and deliver it to the other end. That's all Safaricom did. But I, just, I think um, probably a little bit more time, we all would have got there. OK, so you say better preparation. And it's not rocket science at the end of the day. Not we should all. be able to execute these oh. things. I can we did it. You know, I was on holiday last week. Mm -hmm. And um, I, we, we had conference calls uh, every couple of hours. The first one was at 6. The second one was supposed to be at 9. But by 8 o'clock. I got a text message to say that the conference call is cancelled. The, the results. It's all are fine. It's done. It's over. Done. <laughs> and so you know that could have been done in the first the first time round if we all had more time. Right. Uh, just uh, coming to um, Roadhogs, which you've tweeted about, I and love so it. I must I must mention you were part of the team that launched the Toa Sauti campaign again, another campaign you know to try and and change bad habits. Tell us your thoughts on what we need to do to get past our bad road behavior. Yes, you know, when, when we started, um, I, I, it started for me when I thought we must stop people using mobile phones when they're driving. But then I realized that it was much more than that. And I realized that it's, it's a long-term thing. It's about behavior. It's about attitude. It's about, um, you know, the wellness of the drivers. It's about the, the state of the roads. And so we started to put together a bit of a coalition, uh, which was again drawn from my friends in the media. They've stopped taking my calls now. <laughs> and Bashir doesn't take my calls anymore. <laughs> because whenever I call them, it's because we need to put our collective um, mm -hmm. uh, efforts together. And so we said, look, if you take the PSV drivers, you know, we all, actually, when you look at Roadhog, you don't see that many I was PSV at it tonight, drivers, PSV right? PSV drivers. Right. You know, we're seeing those people who believe that they are beyond the law. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, it's not just politicians, it's also CEOs. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our own, my driving behavior and my driver's behavior has changed significantly, as have some of the other drivers of, of my, my friends and colleagues. Mm -hmm. And so we did things like we started um, 
uh, a wellness campaign, a free wellness campaign, thanks to people like the Aga Khan Hospital, who are doing this for free, the Diabetes Management and, uh, and Information Center. Um, and, you know, we've been running this thing. We've tested more than 2,000, maybe 3,000 drivers so far for free at, at bus stops. And what we found, I, I mean, you know, if you look around here, you'll see 50% of people typically wear glasses. Mm -hmm. How many Latati drivers have you seen wear glasses? And, and they may need them, but they can't need them. afford to and get them. And the guys, they can't afford it. They mm -hmm. don't have the time to do it. <laughs> and so the wellness campaign was one. Uh, we cajoled a few corporates, um, you know, a GM, uh, Safaricom, East Africa Brewery, and a number of others, um, forgive me if I haven't mentioned you, uh, to buy some speed cameras. So we've had 12 speed cameras donated to the police, and that is now, and the police will, you know, will we'll, we'll make some public statements about this, uh, will show you the amount of prosecutions and how they've slowed the traffic down on those roads. And we've, we've done a number of other things. But for us, it is a long-term mm -hmm. campaign. And this is a fantastic campaign because we've been struggling with how do you, how do you get people above impunity? Mm -hmm. And how do you call them to account? And I'm sure one or two people will take you to court. But you know, m my advice is just apologize and drive well. Right. Going to court is not the right thing to do because it is very, very difficult to justify risking the lives and you know Julie you, you and I were again together we, we, we kind of do this stuff a lot huh? <laughs> we were together for the Musangari girls yes, yes you know an absolute disaster and those girls they're such bright young girls that was following the road accident that claimed lives and yes. also maimed a lot of young girls from Musangari school, there can yes. be no excuse mm -hmm. for the kind of behavior that we're seeing on these roads right. which risks the lives of, of you know our young people just our citizens. Uh, uh, you know, we're already at the end of our time for this interview, but I, you know, I've got to ask you this one, Bob. You know, Michael Joseph was a larger than life character in this country. Everybody who remembers Michael Joseph, Short soft spoken, but yes, <laughs> soft spoken, but but a powerful force in industry in this country. And everybody wondered who's going to fit into Michael Joseph's shoes. And Bob Collymore came in and jumped into all these different campaigns. And it almost seems Embrace Kenya. So I ask you, for all the young people watching, for others, other leaders and, and people in different positions who wonder what's, what's the secret to getting things done? What's the secret to success? What is it that drives you? And what, what words of wisdom do you have? Well, apart from height and color, <laughs> there is very little difference between Michael and I. Um, and the secret to <laughs> our success, <laughs> I can say that because I know he's in London right now. Um, the secret, I think the he's secret to success. He's going to hear about it though. But the secret to our su is su success is, is a couple of things. The first thing is you have to be prepared to work hard. Mm -hmm. You have to be prepared to work seven days a week. You know, there's no such thing as a nine to five in our job. The second thing is you have to be passionate about what you do. Michael was always extraordinarily passionate. And when Michael came to talk to me about the job when I was in South Africa, he said to me, one of the reasons why I'm supporting you through this is because I know that you will continue the work which I started particularly in the, in the foundation. And you know, the thing which I think defines Safaricom much more than anything else is not that, that which you started this conversation with. It wasn't about how much profit we make. It's about the difference we make. It's about the fact that over the past 10 years, our foundation has provided uh, specialized medical care to nearly a million people. You know, we've housed, uh, I think, a quarter of a million children are now in, s in classrooms and dormitories because of this. And it's having a passion for that. And, and trust me, I have a big passion for that, as does, as does Michael. So Thank there's you. little difference between Thank us. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for joining us. So it's about hard work, putting the hours in, putting the effort in, and passion as well, are you doing all those things? Uh, maybe that's a question you should be asking, but uh, you know, I, I have an, a, a huge amount of respect for what you've achieved so far, and, and I'm sure and I hope that we will continue to achieve much more in terms of transformation for this country and also to inspire the African continent at large.